So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you and welcome to today's webinar. Um, the title of today's webinar is The Know-How of Doing Business in African Frontiers. And the subtitle of that is Despite the Risks and Challenges Associated with Investing in the Second Wave of Emerging Markets in Sub-Saharan Africa, these frontier markets promise to offer attractive long-term investment potential. Uh, which I believe should probably have a question mark after it. And uh, this is obviously the key issue that we would like to debate today. Um, I would firstly uh, like to thank, obviously, the Super Return team for, for setting up this webinar. Um, I think it would probably be helpful if I just kind of make a few comments in terms of, of housekeeping and structure. Um, firstly, my, m myself, my name is Johannes Gunnell, and I'm the Commercial Director at Maris Limited. Uh, this webinar is, is due to go on for, for roughly an hour. Um, probably spend the first five minutes just a, a brief introduction on, on myself, uh, and then I will also let the uh, four key participants, presenters, um, uh, give a quick background on themselves. Uh, certainly, we want to encourage a, a lively and engaging debate. Um, Super Return team have kindly set out three key discussion points which we will aim to address during the first 20 to 30 minutes uh, of, of this webinar. But we would certainly like uh, any audience members to, um, to participate. Please feel free to, to post your questions and we'll do our best to, to answer those uh, as comprehensively as possible. Um, I mean, this webinar, I guess, is a slight sneak preview for uh, the Super Return Africa conference, which will be happening later in December, from the 4th to the 6th of December. Um, it's in that hardship location, a real frontier market that is the West End in Cape Town. Um, but all of the presenters and myself will be there um, uh, on the Monday uh, for the Frontier Market Summit, uh, and we hope that you'll be able to join us there as well. Um, there is actually a discount offer token, um, which uh, is, I think, here on your screen now. Um, hopefully, you will get a chance to meet us there. But either way, we hope you enjoy today's webinar, and we look forward to your interactions. Um, with that, um, I would obviously uh, like to introduce our participants. Firstly, I'll just give you a quick background on myself. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Commercial Director at Maris Limited. Uh, we are a Mauritius-based holding company. We're focused on investment in Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, we are probably on the more frontier end of investment. Um, the genesis of Maris was actually as a uh, post-conflict uh, frontier market venture capital fund started in 2009. Uh, and believe it or not, our first investments were in South Sudan. Uh, we still have investments there, but we've diversified into Tanzania, Kenya, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Angola, um, DRC, and now Rwanda. Um, we are focused on four sectors. We do property, we do gold mining, um, business services, agriculture, and forestry. Uh, we tend to be more focused on startup businesses. And most recently, uh, I guess we have kind of gone slightly uh, more up the blue chip scale by, by launching a, a vehicle called Africa Logistics Properties which both uh, ourselves and CDC and IFC are invested in, which is building out industrial warehousing uh, across Africa. Um, we are big believers in frontier markets. We acknowledge they are, they are risky places, they're volatile, but you can generate good returns. We've managed to generate good returns from our investors, and we do believe it's an area not just for the, the traditional DFI investors, we, for instance, only have FMO as, as one of our investors in Maris, but we believe that private investors, if they've got the risk appetite, can also make good returns in frontier markets. With that, I would like to introduce our four participants. Um, we have Andreas Bompaleski, who is the partner at African Platform Capital. We have Vivina Berla, who is the co-managing partner at Serona Asset Management. And we have Aubrey Ruby, who's the co-founder of the Africa Expert Networker and Senior Fellow at the Africa Center. We have David Cowan, who is the Africa Economist at City, who some of you may already know. Uh, with that, in turn, I would like uh, the participants to please introduce themselves, um, and I will do it in, uh, well, in the order I see them on the slide. Uh, Andreas. Uh, 
Uh, terrific. Uh, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Just very briefly, by my background on, on myself, uh, I'm a private equity investor specialized in the consumer sector where I've been investing for over a decade, primarily in, in Europe in the early years and during the last four years, focused on, on emerging markets uh, and more latterly, uh, exclusively sub-Saharan uh, sub -Saharan Africa, so, so the consumer sector in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, with a specialist focus in terms of Africa Platform Capital, which is the investment vehicle uh, that I sit behind that seeks to not only invest in, in the continent and in the sector, but specifically bring expertise and capabilities to bear um, with, a, with a sort of dedicated operating, and, uh, operating partner model in the businesses that we invest in, recognizing the, the nuances and challenges, not just in frontier markets in Africa, but perhaps more broadly, and doing so both prior to investing as well as uh, post-investment, which I can talk about a bit more later on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Andreas. And uh, maybe if we uh, move on to Vivina. Uh, thank you, Johannes, for an excellent introduction. My name is uh, Vivina Berla. Um, my uh, love affair with Africa started about 40 years ago when my parents moved from Italy to Kenya. Since then, I've been traveling in and out and across left and right, north and south of the continent. Currently, as Johannes mentioned, I'm the co-managing partner of Saron Asset Management. Saron Asset Management is uh, a firm that uh, is focused exclusively on making private equity investments in uh, funds that are based in um, frontier and emerging markets. We have, I suppose, what uh, has at times been called a double bottom line. So the intention is to deploy smart capital to smart local GPs and fund managers who, by virtue of bringing capital to local entrepreneurial companies, can actually make both a healthy profit, but also a sustainable developmental difference to the communities and the environment where the investments are made. Africa is a, a large target market for us. To date, we have invested in uh, over 20 African countries, and I actually include North Africa as well as Sub-Saharan Africa in this. We have invested in 14, one, four different funds, and those funds have invested in uh, over 80 companies. We invest across sectors, um, but uh, as PRI signatories and uh, sustainability conscious investors, we do exclude um, all uh, sort of, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Harmful sectors. So no gambling, no weapons, um, no hard alcohol, no tobacco. And by the way, uh, we have also uh, excluded um, extractive mining from our investable sectors. And there I pause. Thank you, Vivina. Uh, and Aubrey, if you'd kindly introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Aubrey Ruby. Uh, I am the founder of something called the Africa Expert Network. Uh, we connect investors to experts across African markets. I've been in the advisory space uh, in African markets for the last uh, 15 years, having worked across 30 markets, uh, sector agnostic, uh, just the region specific, and mainly have helped investors with deal origination, uh, partner identification and vetting, uh, due diligence, uh, kind of stakeholder engagement, and um, competitive intelligence. So uh, kind of a wide swath from investors at the venture level all the way up to very large investors in infrastructure. Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, and finally, David. Um, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, I'm David Caron. I'm the Africa Economist at City. I've been here since 2007. Um, and I've looked at Africa in various guises before that. 
Uh, we spent the last sort of 20 years trying to understand what's going on in Africa on the economic front. Uh, in particular, in recent years, we've been struggling to try and work out what's going on the currencies, which is a big issue for most of you investors out there in Africa. Um, I'm not sure I've got any answers yet, but we're trying to at least get a, a better understanding of what's going on. So um, hopefully I can add some background economic information to, to what our other panelists are going to be able to talk about in terms of um, uh, investment opportunities. That's brilliant. Well, look, look thank you, David. Um, yes, I, I'm not, not sure any of us have all the answers, but I think we're all constantly learning, uh, and hopefully uh, that's what we all will on this webinar and, and our audience as well. Um, just, just finally, uh, for anyone who, who's just joined us slightly late, please feel free to, to uh, pose questions uh, through, the, uh, through the interface, uh, and I believe there will be a recorded version of the webinar uh, available later. Uh, and Svetlana and the team will, will send around an email. Uh, and with that, I would obviously like to, to move on to the meat of the discussion. Um, so starting off with the, with the three key discussion points that, that were put forward on the invite, and we will kind of answer these in turn, but, but as, as we discussed, um, the participants um, should feel free to, to interact as they see appropriate and to generate a lively debate. So I think starting off with, with Aubrey, um, I would perhaps uh, ask you on the first point, what opportunities do Africa's frontier markets bring to fund managers and investors, and, and how do they compare to first-generation emerging markets? Well, I think many of us on this call and probably those uh, listening in the audience uh, are big believers in the growth opportunity presented by African markets. Uh, from a global perspective, 70% uh, of global growth will be driven out of uh, emerging and frontier markets moving forward. So we know it's a, a, a originator of growth. Uh, growth and uh, returns often go hand in hand. And so a lot of the interest is coming out of a, a search for returns by, for example, large uh, institutional players who need to return to their uh, pensioners. Uh, greater returns of eight, greater of eight percent, so that leads to emerging markets. Um, I think what's been a little bit more difficult in the Africa space is the ups and downs of rapid growth, uh, which is true everywhere. So you basically have a situation where, um, you know, Nigeria and South Africa have been in a recession in the past uh, 18 to 24 months. Uh, both have emerged out slowly, but the growth rates that we saw in 2014 haven't returned uh, to the continent yet. So I think it's the ups and downs of um, frontier market investing that uh, investors need to learn how to uh, navigate and explain to their LPs. Um, as, par as far as India and China, they've had a, a longer period of time to sustain that growth um, and are both larger markets, uh, larger uniform markets. And GPs have kind of invested quite a bit on the ground to build out local presence, which I think is in still early stages in, in African markets. Well, yes. No, I, I think we'd agree, and, and that's very, very helpful. And, and maybe, maybe I'll direct it uh, and ask Vina for her views. I mean, your company's obviously invested in, in quite a lot of funds and across a lot of African markets. What, what would your views be on the issue? Um, thank you, Johannes. Um, I think the, the first comment that springs to mind is, uh, you know, Africa is often looked at as, as a continent, as an opportunity. However, it is actually very helpful to be more discerning and granular about the analysis. Um, I start with a with a question to, to myself and, and, and to the rest of the panelists here, you know, how do we define Africa's frontier markets versus first generation emerging markets? Um, is it both within Africa? If that is the case, I would say that there is certain African markets such as South Africa that are clearly more mature and more advanced than uh, countries such as Nigeria that has more recently become, um, to some investors, um, 
a center of, of, of attention. Uh, in terms of opportunities, what do they bring? There has been a interesting um, study that uh, has just been published by uh, the Africa Venture Capital Association about you know when they invest in Africa, why are they investing in Africa, and what are the biggest challenges that uh, that they identify. And I would say that the biggest opportunities um, tend to be, as Aubrey already mentioned, uh, linked to growth. And to say a little bit more about that, it's in particular the growth of the consumer, um, as well as of the emerging middle class that is uh, looking really for goods and services that are fairly basic and at the moment are uh, often imported rather than produced locally. Um, so to the extent that we can identify as investors specific areas, specific sectors, specific trends, including, for example, urbanization, which is part also of the consumer growth stories. Um, when we look at growth, what else is driving it is job creation. You create jobs, you pay more salaries, people have more spending power, and it creates a virtuous circle that, to the extent that we as investors can identify those opportunities uh, through research, through analysis, through choice of locally based boots on the ground investors who know how to generate deal flow, add value to the companies and then exit those companies to generate the returns, I think we will all be well served. The, the final thing I would say that I think is is also driving um, the, the, the interest uh, currently expressed in Africa, which is higher than it has been in the past. Part of it is the growth. Part of it is the fact that um, the way that companies are, are generating returns in Africa tends to be decorrelated from most of the drivers in developed markets and, and other emerging markets, actually. And then finally, there is this uh, heavy focus in certain circles, not every circle, but in certain circles, to join forces to meet the Sustainable Development Goals uh, challenge. And Africa, um, I believe, we believe, uh, is perfectly poised to, to help in that endeavor. Well, well, thank you, Vivina. Uh, and perhaps moving on to David, I mean, you've obviously uh, experienced uh, the ups and downs of various uh, emerging and frontier markets. It would be interesting to hear your views. Yeah, I guess, look, um, I come into this from a, quite a long haul, I would argue, to you sometimes. And, uh, you know, for someone who, um, who grew up as a child in Africa, right, but then actually went to study his A-levels in Hong Kong. So I sort of came out of Asia. Uh, having studied economics for the first time, and then came back to Africa. And so, look, the, the bit I answer is probably more about the second half of the question to you, right? How do they compare to other first-generation emerging markets? So what do we think about Africa, perhaps, in relation to Asia or, or even Latin America? And I think that there's some very interesting things. I think there is a, a broad sentiment that I get out there that, you know, and I've spoken to quite a lot of corporates today where some of the problems we've experienced in the last two, three years are not that different to what they've experienced in, say, Vietnam or in Malaysia or in Ecuador or whatever, right? Or even, in fact, what they're experiencing in Venezuela now, right? So, I mean, um, so I think there are those broad similarities, but I do think that it's probably important to, to tease out perhaps some of the, um, the other differences that we also know from Africa at the moment compared to other frontier markets. And what I would actually advise people to do if they have the, the sort of the academic or the sort of the intellectual inclination is to pick up the latest edition of the IMS Regional Economic Outlook for Sub-Saharan Africa and read the chapter there on structural diversification and whether Africa has made progress with it. But it does raise some interesting points that, that we should think about certainly in terms of our investment strategy, I think, for everyone out there. So the first point really is about industrialization. You know, is Africa able to emulate the industrialization strategies we've seen in other parts of the world, particularly Asia? And I think there is a growing consensus that probably not. It won't be achieved, although places like Ethiopia are, are, are certainly giving it a go. 
But I think what we have seen, and this is important to bear in mind, is that with some of the big moves in exchange rates we've seen recently, there is this idea that import um, substitution industrialization can work in Africa, in places like Egypt and Nigeria. So I think that will be the really interesting challenge. Maybe Africa won't industrialize on the export model we've seen in Asia, but it will perhaps do it along import substitution lines. So I think that's, that's a really interesting argument and how exchange rates are going to drive that. I think the other thing we see, obviously, is that you know, Africa still has a huge agricultural potential. And you know, this argument we've had for quite a long time, and I think is still just as valid, is that you know, can Africa emerge to feed Asia going forward, and how that is going to happen? And I think that's a huge one-off opportunity. We know that Asia is a land-poor region, uh, but with huge population pressures on it, whereas we know that Africa has a lot of potential in the agricultural sector. It's about releasing that potential over what time frame, and how to get things sorted, such as land access, um, what sort of model wants to come out for governments, and that, that sort of thing really has to move ahead quite strongly over the next year. So, so that's the second difference, I would say. There is a lot more agricultural potential in Africa than in, perhaps in other parts of the world. I think the other thing to bear in mind from a more immediate investment perspective is that one thing that comes out very clearly at the moment in the academic work is that Africa has a higher level of informal sector economic activity than we see at other countries, emerging markets, frontier markets, when they were with similar countries with the same GDP. GDP per capita. And so somehow you've got to figure that in. And you know, the challenge, that works both ways. The challenge for African governments, many who are facing significant fiscal crisis, is how they start to tax that informal sector. But from a market perspective, and now we're talking about consumer perspective, um, as well as, as other employment perspectives, businesses have to work out how to deal with the African informal sector, which, as I said, is larger than we would expect. So, so the broad picture is, yes, I think we are very similar to other frontier markets. There's no point pretending that there's a deep degree of African exceptionalism. I mean, it seems to be that there's a, you know, many similarities and different uh, similarities that we can see across. But there are these specific ones that I think probably do have to focus our minds on how we access the market. And then the, just the final thing I'd say, perhaps, you know, you, and I think it was alluded to a little bit by, by some of the other speakers. Remember, look, Africa, perhaps its biggest difference is that it is a lot of markets. You know, it's, it's 45, if you include North Africa, you know, you're looking at 50 countries here uh, in a very large land area. That, that does pose its own logistic challenges, but it means that there's lots of different things going on in different places at the continent. Now, yes, all continents, Latin America, even parts of Asia, you know, have different countries, but the the number of countries in the geographical space is quite unique for Africa. And so it's how we think about that overall, I think, is very important in terms of our, our thought process to investing in Africa, especially at the moment where some of the large economies, Egypt, Nigeria, and South Africa, are in problems, and there's a lot of focus on some of the smaller economies. Well, thank, thank you, David. Uh, I mean, I think that raises some, some interesting points, and uh, at this point, I'd actually like to bring Andreas, in, I mean, certainly with your background and kind of having invested in, in consumer spaces, it was interesting. David touched on the issue of, of currencies and import substitution. Davina also talked about the urbanization story and consumer growth. Now, a lot of time people say, well, the opportunities in African frontier markets uh, are in consumer spaces. Um, we as Maris have found it quite difficult to invest in the consumer space in frontier markets given currency issues and uh, and the like. Uh, and that has tended to force us more into kind of commodity real estate investments. But uh, given your background, it would be great to, to understand, you know, what what kind of opportunities you do see in the frontier markets. Are they in consumer? And I think that also leads on to the second question, you know, what are the most promising frontier markets in Africa? Absolutely. Um, so look, just trying to build on some of the points that have already been made, I guess I would use of three different lenses just to look at the attractiveness of, of specific markets, and then I'll come back to, to the consumer opportunity underlying that. I, I, I think one of the challenges when people have looked at Africa is, and this goes for, for many other emerging markets as well, I think, is the sort of headline GDP. So if we look at the, the, the first point, headline GDP data for a lot of these markets is, is quite attractive. And, and if you look at markets like Ethiopia, for example, perhaps one of the frontier markets, if we were to define some for the purposes of this discussion, 
has had sort of plus five percent to eight percent type uh, GDP growth rates for a considerable time period. Now, David talked about the industrialization of that economy. So you've got the sort of headline GDP data, which for many of these markets is is, is quite attractive. I, I think sometimes that can be misleading from an investment perspective, because if you then look at a, a sort of second lens of evaluating these markets and you look perhaps at the ease of doing business, and, and, and again, a generic term, um, you know, people may question the validity of some of these surveys, but what it helps to, to, to I guess, is a consistent fact base across across the continent. And so you take a market like Ethiopia, for example, uh, very attractive GDP growth rates. You look at the ease of doing business, and this is based on World Bank data, so a data point. Um, it ranks at 161 out of 190, so very, very low down in terms of the ease of doing business. That's broken down to further subcomponents. But again, you know, immediately moving away from pure headline growth to some of the more specifics that might be relevant from an investment perspective can give you a very different perspective. And then thirdly, and, and I suppose most relevant for, for a GP like you and I, Johannes, if you then look at the micro and the readiness of some of these businesses to take outside capital, I, I fully agree with you. You look at a lot of these markets, attractive GDP growth rates, perhaps slightly easier, ease of doing business than, than Ethiopia that I mentioned, but you look at the opportunity to actually invest that in viable propositions, and it becomes much, much harder. And so from our perspective, as we, as we seek opportunities, it isn't so much to look at which are the fastest growing markets and which are more frontier versus more established. It is on a sector-by-sector -sector basis assessing where the, the underlying micro-growth trends, so for example, look at penetration of formal retail, um, what, what stage of evolution a particular market might be, how big that market is. Let's not forget, again, to David's point, some of these markets are very, very small um, and are not that well interconnected in terms of forming a, a larger regional market. And having established then is to go in and look at the, the specific um, markets and, and, and investable opportunities. And by investable opportunity, I don't just mean size of business or number of businesses. I mean, actually, the readiness of businesses to take outside capital. And maybe we can come back to this a very specific micro point. And so to answer the last part of your question, what are the most promising frontier markets? Actually, I think the, the, the East Africa region, and, and I'll go on a limb here, perhaps controversially, given what's, what's very happening right now in, in markets like Kenya, um, I do find quite attractive because m many subsectors and consumer that we, that we look at are at a more advanced stage of development. Businesses are of a size where certainly their ability to take reasonable chunks of capital is, 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 is existent. But also the ease of doing business, notwithstanding issues around perhaps corruption and where, where, where those markets might rank, but, but purely in comparison to many other markets in Africa, um, we, we find there is an ability to, to invest in businesses, but also really develop those businesses and bring in our expertise and help them grow. Let me, let me pause there. Great. Well, 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 thank you on that. And I mean, uh, I, I have sympathy. I mean, uh, we, we have struggled uh, to, to invest in Ethiopia, and um, I think it is not that it's a fact that it's not an attractive market. And even though I have many family members who are there, uh, um, we have still struggled. And I, I think you really do need to get down to the nitty gritty of the micro and the specific opportunities. Um, but, but with that, maybe I open the question to Vivina, um, given I imagine some of the funds that you've invested in have, have made investments in, in the consumer space. And, and so what have been the most promising frontier markets uh, in your experience? Uh, thank you, Johannes. I, I would sort of go even a step further down into the micro. Um, you know, we, we, we were looking, and Andrea spoke about sectors. I would say that the company itself is just as important, and it touches also on the question of risks. So um, Sarona's strategy has been thought out to try and actually maximize risk-adjusted returns. And of course, risk-adjusted returns, by definition, includes where are the best opportunities to achieve the highest possible return, but at the same time, where should we invest to try and minimize the risk at the same time? And so when we're talking about promising frontier markets in Africa, we are looking at, I suppose, starting from the bottom, at the best possible companies and then the best possible GPs 
local GPs that are going to find those companies and help them grow and achieve the results that we expect. And then, and only then, um, do we then also incorporate the concept of the macro and the risks, etc. Now, this is not in chronological order. This is in order of importance. To phrase it a different way, we have um, designed a Sarona risk country score, which is a combination of different indices that are available in the public um, domain. But that is really uh, an attempt uh, by Sarona to rule out those countries that are either too small or where the rule of law is completely broken down or where the trends are sort of going down rather than up. And so, for example, we would exclude Sudan, we would exclude Somalia, we would exclude, uh, um, I don't know, give me a Guinea, -Bissau, Guinea Equatorial Guinea, um, for the reason that I just mentioned, either size or trend. But having achieved that minimum level of comfort, then a country becomes part of the investable universe. The point then becomes, do we invest in a fund that is country specific or do we invest in a fund that actually has a regional reach? And that will depend upon the size of the country. So we would consider a country specific fund for Nigeria, South Africa, for example, because we believe that there is enough opportunities there for a fund manager to be successful sticking to their countries. But more often than not, as we discussed previously, Africa is a big continent. There is a lot of different types of opportunities. And um, David talked about import substitution. That is a very big theme, investable theme for us, together with consumer growth. But then the other theme that we have seen emerge is actually regionalization. So you might find a fund manager that has invested in a Nigerian company and helps that company actually export in neighboring countries. An interesting trend recently actually is we have invested in a fund manager in North Africa and when they started the fund it was on the basis that there was a growth potential in the trade from North Africa into Europe. More recently and in my mind fascinatingly so, now these North African-based companies are actually growing by exporting into sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, I think uh, the question, which one are the most promising frontier markets? Um, we look for fund managers that are going to find the most promising companies um, and then build them as well, as strongly, and as fast as they possibly can while taking risk, reducing risk through, importantly, very high level of ESG, environmental, social, and governance standards. Because many of the risks that have been mentioned during the call until now relate to um, you know, corruption, uh, lack of governance, uh, government intervention. So we try and minimize that by focusing on the mid-market growth stage segment of economies where companies do not attract the attention of governments and nationalization and where there is strong opportunity for growth. All right. Okay. Well, well thank you for that. And, um, and I'm just conscious on time because we've also had some questions come through. So um, I'm going to open that final question up to both Aubrey and David, but would ask kind of maybe if you can keep your answers relatively brief. And I'm, I'm also going to try and put you on the spot in terms of uh, forcing you to name one, two or three of your most promising frontier markets. So uh, Aubrey, if I can uh, throw the question at you. Sure. I like Nigeria. Um, I, despite the slow growth and kind of early floundering the Buhari administration, I still believe there are many sectors in Nigeria that um, are, have pent-up demand, uh, especially around things like import substitution. 
and the early stage kind of venture, the formalizing the informal market uh, companies that are operating in that space have all shown very promising growth even despite the uh, the recession. So given its size and dynamism, um, I'm bullish on uh, Nigeria. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you. And if I had to force you to name another one, um, maybe more frontier. <laughs> I like I like I like Morocco and Ethiopia as well. Um, I kind of fall on larger markets, uh, but again, it depends on the sector. Uh, certain sectors work better in uh, Ethiopia than others. Uh, and then Morocco, I like because it not only has uh, kind of renewable energy opportunities. Uh, and manufacturing opportunities, but Moroccan companies are very focused on investing in other sub-Saharan African countries, so it's easy to develop kind of a a um, uh, regional strategy, a la what Vivina had said earlier. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, David, if I can put you on the spot. Well, I think there's, I think of Africa in four ways at the moment a little bit, right, in terms of which I think are the most promising markets, right? So as Aubrey said, I think it's interesting. I actually count Morocco as what I call a defensive play, right? And I think there's nothing wrong with that, that, you know, it has a slow-growing home market, but you can get a pickup in terms of its external exposure to Africa. Maybe Tunisia you could account to that. So I think it's worthwhile always having a defensive investment in your portfolio. The converse of that I think people have mentioned is you have a growth, um, a growth play in your investment portfolio, right? And the two places that are growing fast are obviously the EAC and Ethiopia. And then one that hasn't been mentioned, of course, the West African franc zone, um, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, which also gives you a little bit of exposure up into the Malis and Nigers of this world. So, you know, that's the growth one. I think the most interesting one, though, for people and uh, at this moment is what I call the, the currency move entry points, right? Now, the, what we've seen in the last few years is that currencies have moved a substantial way in many African countries. And, you know, there's a, there's a real question you can ask is, does this really create the once-in-a-decade buying opportunity? You know, and so those countries are clearly uh, uh, Nigeria, the Naira now, you're now is trading at 365 from 165, and Egypt, where the Egyptian pound has moved from 8.81 to, to where it's trading now, 18, 17 and a half to the dollar. You could include Zambia, Uganda in that, the way the, uh, the Congolese franc, the DRC, you could include in that. And then maybe next year, if the, if the Angolans get their act together and the Kwanzaa moves probably from 165 to where it's got to end up, 400, then that would be another of those currency entry points. You know, and there's an argument somewhere like Nigeria that when the currency has moved this far, if it's trading at 400 in five or six years' time, that wouldn't surprise me so much. I think the complicated ones are the ones that I can't put in any of those categories. So places like Kenya, where I worry about the currency. Mozambique, where there's been a big currency adjustment, but there is there something to play out. Ghana still causes me a degree of puzzlement going forward. And then perhaps to swap it around and say to you, okay, which are the promising, which is, which is the one I would stay away from at this point, and I would point out to people, and I did mention it to some people earlier this year and a bit surprised, is actually Tanzania. Not because of the economic numbers, but I might stay away from Tanzania just because of the policy uncertainty. I think it is a re valuable reminder that you know presidents can be powerful in Africa. They can make policy decisions that impact on your investment, and those decisions can be very unexpected and really come out of you know uh, ballpark, left ballpark, right, which you're not really seeing, and that can pose a big problem for you. So I might say if I had an investment or thinking about an investment in Tanzania, I would stand off at the moment and let's see how things go forward from there. I couldn't agree okay, more well, on the well, Tanzania piece. Well, well, thank, thank you guys. We we have uh, two investments in Tanzania, so uh, <laughs> we can speak from. <laughs> if you're there already, <laughs> we're there already. I mean, certainly. I mean, for what it's worth, I'll put my two bobs worth in. Um, I mean, from our our perspective, I guess as Maris, that uh, yeah, Tanzania, the politics have definitely got worse. Um, we're slightly insulated because we're in the. Uh, partly in the agricultural sector and construction machinery. So we should hopefully benefit from infrastructure spend and agriculture is kind of slightly softer, so less exposed to kind of adverse government policy. But, but things have definitely deteriorated there. Um, Ethiopia definitely is a, is a long-term winner, as, as will Nigeria be, although we don't invest there. Uh, we certainly wouldn't encourage anyone to really invest in South Sudan, um, although we have put some, some solar plants in there. And believe it or not, we've actually had our best ever year in South Sudan, thanks to our forestry business. Um, we've got sustainable teak plantation, 
And what I think that does show is that even in the worst um, and most difficult frontier markets, if you do have a solid business, um, as Davina mentioned, and you run it well on good criteria and ESG criteria, you can actually perform well despite all of the the, the bad macro and, and political that, that's going on around you. And a lot of that is driven by um, engaging well with the local community uh, because ultimately they are your greatest protection against adverse policy moves, particularly from uh, rogue central governments. Um, and then in terms of if actual growth, I mean, I would agree Angola, you know, it's a big market mismanaged, um, but if it does, you know, recover, it, it'll probably do pretty well. Um, Mozambique, we are quite heavily invested in. It is very much uh, all around the LNG story up in the north where where we are exposed and we are big, you know, we're betting big on that. So if you were to ask me which country has the potential to generate 20, 25% GDP growth rates, a bit like Angola did in the, in the mid 2000s, then I would say Mozambique is the one if the, if the government can finally get its act together. But as a long-term promising frontier market play, I think you've got to stick with the big countries. I think you've got to go with Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, to a lesser extent, Angola. Um, with that, um, I'm conscious we've, we've done 40 minutes, and I want to try and get questions in uh, from the audience. Um, and perhaps uh, most um, kind of relevant, uh, we've had a question here. What are the main risks in terms of investment in Africa? Employees, legal and political framework, currency, water, reliable energy, uh, question mark. Um, I'm going to try and get through quite a few of these uh, questions. So I'd ask the participants if you can try and limit your answers to one minute, that'd be great. And we'll, we'll try and bang through these questions. So uh, I'll open it up first to Andreas. Uh, thanks, Johannes. Uh, obviously very sectoral dependent uh, in terms of the risks that have been that have been listed, but I think from our perspective, the ones that really shine a light on are, are employees. Uh, if, if we look at them, the context of just the depth of management talent that's available, um, the level of development and education that many employees have, and therefore what's actually required to help a business grow, which I think in many cases people uh, underestimate. And the other I would flag would be currency uh, and the volatility we've seen and being hard currency investors. Um, the impact that can have on your return, or rather the additional growth you need to achieve to overcome the currency devaluation. Yeah, I would definitely agree on that. Uh, Aubrey? Um, from my perspective, yeah, from my perspective, um, I think the main risks in African markets are counterparty risks. So understanding, uh, you know, partners' ability to pay, uh, to execute, to implement on whatever agreement you have, is the main risk versus kind of geopolitical or political risk. Um, I don't think, you know, threat of nationalization and things of that uh, loom large. I think more what happens is uh, problems with local partners. Uh, the number one uh, question and, um, and kind of project I've worked on uh, over the last 15 years is partner identification and vetting. Uh, investors often don't know who to work with uh, on the ground. Yeah, definitely agree. Uh, David? Um, I, I would run with exchange rates, but I'll put my nerdy economist hat on for you and tell it to you in a slightly complicated way that you should think about, right? Um, look, I think there's two exchange rate issues that have happened in Africa in the last few years, right? The first is we can tie into the oil exporters, and that dates from late 2014 and the decline in the price of oil, right? And if you look at all those markets, the reality is that earnings from oil are the biggest factor that comes onto the FX market. The price of oil halved. Your currencies have had to come under pressure, as we've seen the Naira, the Kwanzaa will do, the CFA are desperately holding on, right? So you want to separate them out. They're, they're a group. And interestingly, you know, I think that, you know, in fact, my point about Nigeria is that if you don't think your oil price is going to go much away from 50, or even if it goes down to 40, maybe that doesn't matter too much for Nigeria, the, the, the Naira adjustment has happened. For the rest of Africa, really the exchange rate problems start with the fiscal. You know, I put this graph, who will follow the CD? And the CD's problem is a fiscal problem where the government has lost control of its fiscal. Now, from a business, you know, the, the answer is perhaps, if you're thinking about currencies, which countries do you have the most confidence in that can sort their fiscal performance out or who will go down the, the Ghana, the CD route? 
Um, remember, from a business perspective, the, the closing of every fiscal deficit has two sides. First, the government controls expenditure, but then the government raises taxes, right? So for all businesses, you've got to bear that in mind. But if you can have confidence that a government can get on top of its fiscal situation, then I think that that's a, a, a really good point to say, okay, then I'm less worried about currency volatility going forward. Therefore, that's where, that where I put my money. Um, but I think this battle is really going to be fought out over Africa, right? Um, the fiscal problem is at the core of our macroeconomic problems at the moment. And, you know, the governments that address that best will be the best position going forward. And that's something I'm thinking a lot about. Probably don't have many good answers at the moment, but hopefully over the course of next year I will. Because, look, next year I think is actually quite important in this fiscal battle, right? Because it's the first year. If you think about it, if you stand back, once we're through the... Um, you know, okay, it's a pre-election year in Nigeria. The Egyptian elections are in um, May, I think. They'll probably hold them. And then South Africa goes to the National Elective Conference later this year. But if you take those big three out, there's not many elections in Africa next year, apart from Cameroon. There's some smaller countries, um, Zimbabwe. But look, that is a year where we have to see progress on the fiscal. And if we see progress in fiscal in some countries, then I think you can start to get more, more positive about their, their currency outlook. So you know, it's, it's complicated. Currency is your big risk, but don't always think of currency in, in sort of straightforward terms. It's about what the fiscal is doing. All right. Well, well thank you for that, David. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to try and be strict and, and, and limit people to, to one to two minutes on their answers, but, but thank you very much. I'm actually going to throw out a different question to Vivina now to, to get through these. Um, so uh, a slightly um, uh, unusual one from what we've been talking about, but someone's asked what the appetite for green renewable bonds in Africa are. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to the frontier markets, but perhaps uh, you, you may have an interesting view on it. Uh, I'm afraid I don't. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Um, the only comment I could make is that uh, there is an increased amount of um, uh, sovereign wealth funds and uh, nationally, locally based pension funds, and they will uh, have money to allocate going forward. It just might be that green bonds will be interesting for them, but I really do not know. But with, with your permission, can I just make two very quick points on risk? Because I think it's a very important dimension. And that is, first point, quickly, perceived risk of doing business in Africa is usually a lot higher than the real risk if you're actually investing with experience, knowledge, and thoughtfulness. And the second thing is that if you look at the risks at the portfolio level rather at rather than at the individual company level, you can actually diversify them significantly. And specifically relating to currency, you can diversify currency two ways. One is across countries. And the second one, which is often underestimated, is across time. And across time, if you invest in Nigeria before and, and or after the depreciation, we have already mentioned it, it you know, would deliver very different results. So risks are not as scary as people think they are. Well, I, I would agree with that. And, and uh, I think that is a, a very cogent point. Um, I mean, for what it's worth, again, I'll throw my two cents worth in. I mean, I would probably say currency is the thing that we, we think about most. Um, and it's not necessarily always adverse currency movements. Um, for us, I think 86% of our revenues are dollar or dollar denominated. The things which have really killed us have actually, actually been access to, to Forex. And for instance, in Angola, where we um, uh, sell JCB machines, suddenly if you can't access Forex to buy your machines from, from, uh, from the UK or India, you suddenly have a problem. Uh, and likewise, in South Sudan, it was less access to Forex, but an exchange rate which went from six, uh, sorry, from five to 60 in the space of three months. If you've got receivables and dollar linked uh, over the course of uh, three months, um, that's a pretty painful adjustment to, uh, to make. So, so those have been our, our, our key, uh, key issues. Um, and so access to Forex, I think, is a, is a big one to think about. Uh, and then um, uh, another question, I guess, relating around uh, risk. 
which is which sub-Saharan countries do you view as having the greatest risk of nationalization of private sector assets and or businesses? Uh, and again, probably a, a quick fire question to, to each of the panelists to, to give their view on that. So starting off with Aubrey. I'll go first, Tanzania. For me, uh, I believe that the government has been very focused on kind of state as the main driver of economic growth, and you see what's happened in the mining sector uh, and power sectors. I think Tanzania is the main risk, but generally, I don't think nationalization is a risk across the African market. Sure. Uh, and Andreas? Yeah, look, Tanzania stands out. I mean, I suppose the other one um, to highlight would be would be Zimbabwe. Uh, we, we may be past the worst of, of sort of nationalisation or expropriation in the country, but um, things still haven't settled down yet. So other than Tanzania, I'd say Zimbabwe. Um, to uh, to David. Uh, well, I'd buy Audrey's point on uh, Tanzania. I mean, the other one you may think about in a in a slightly more interesting way, which may come out in other countries, is obviously Rwanda and Crystal Ventures. Uh, requiring to have a stake in your company as you go forward, right? I think this idea of having Africa, it's not quite nationalization, but having some sort of government investment vehicle that is required to, to make an investment in your company, I think, could become an emerging theme going forward. Understood. And, and to Vivina. Um, I agree with uh, the previous speakers. I would add the sort of... Uh, uh, indirect nationalization, meaning not uh, straighten out expropriation, but maybe just changing policies and regulations in a way that would affect the performance of a sector. And so, for example, take education, take healthcare, which are subject to regulatory uh, oversight, um, strict regulatory oversight. If there is any major changes that are decided at the government level, um, take Egypt. Uh, could that be something that, for whatever reason, they can decide to interfere with? Um, possibly. Okay, well, thank you for that. And actually, that leads in quite neatly to another question that we had from the audience, which uh, is to what extent do the unique set of political challenges uh, that are presented in Africa impede foreign investment, uh, and what can investors do to, to get around these? Um, maybe throwing it back to Andreas. Um, look, I think, I think very, very sector and very country, very country specific. Um, we don't intend to invest in politically sensitive uh, sectors, but I suppose the one point I would throw out is having a local partner, uh, be that in an advisory capacity or be that a fellow uh, private sector investor, at least in my experience, tends to be a very effective way of addressing what political or regulatory risk there may be in a specific market. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, and, and Aubrey? I, I mean, I think I don't have much to add uh, for the, everyone else is covered. I think that's a pretty solid approach. Sure. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting what you said, Andreas. From our side, I mean, we, we have tended to work perhaps a bit less with uh, foreign, uh, sorry, with local partners. Um, local advisors, yes. Um, we, we sometimes find it can get quite complicated on the on the shareholder list. Um, but um, I'm not sure, David, if uh, if you have some views as to the unique set of challenges, uh, political challenges Africa presents. Well, I'm not sure that they're the unique set of political challenges. I mean, the only other option I'd say, apart from having a local partner, is, and I, and I think we can see this in the policy debate, is about obtaining listings, right? I mean, we, we know that a lot of companies are now under pressure to take listings, which is another form of taking a local partner, but perhaps a slightly more transparent one. And certainly in the PE industry, you know, it is also part of potential exit strategy. Um, so, you know, that perhaps is, is all I would say. But I don't really, I'm, I'm deadly unconvinced that Africa's political problems are more unique than anywhere else in the world when I look at what's going on in Venezuela or <laughs> what's going on in <laughs> other parts of the world. I, I, the, the politics is part of life of investing in frontier markets. And it can be capricious at times, but it, it can also work in your favor at times. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's very true. And then I'm just conscious of time. We're kind of coming up to our final five minutes, so maybe I'll throw kind of one 
final last question into the ring, which was actually kind of uh, highlighted here under our key discussion points. And, and thank you, everyone, for kind of answering quickly in a, a climax of quickfire questions. Um, but I think it's good to try and get as much in as possible. Um, and, and so lastly, um, what is the future of fundraising and then investing in Africa's frontier markets? And uh, I would uh, open that up to Vivina. Um, what is the future? Bright, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but I have no evidence. Um, the, the, I already mentioned the recent uh, African Venture Capital Association results of the survey. Um, they interviewed about 58 global LPs of all types, DFIs, private sectors, family offices, uh, pension funds, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, the answers there are there is increased interest, um, and uh, we hope that uh, the money will follow the words this time. Well, uh, I, I would certainly hope so as well. Um, so, uh, Aubrey, your views? Listen, it's been a very difficult fundraising environment over the, the past uh, two years uh, for, for GPs looking for uh, to build out funds, and that's been because of the macroeconomic situation across African markets, slow growth, the challenges in South Africa and in um, Nigeria have, have kind of influenced uh, the outlook and the currency challenges. Um, so I anticipate uh, things picking up uh, after these next round of elections that were mentioned, uh, and when the view of the stability in Nigeria, South Africa, and Kenya improve, that will help the overall sell of African opportunities to institutional and commercial investors. And, uh, and Andrea? Yeah, look, let me let me be a bit more controversial to 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 finish things off, Johannes. I, th I think um, we've talked a lot about a lot of aspects, but I guess um, the discussion and it being super return driven is on investments. And I think one has to face up to the reality that investment returns from Africa. So this is aggregated fund returns, not specific deals and not isolating specific funds, but but the aggregate um, has been poor. Um, and, and uh, you know, has been has been at that level for for some time. And these are just absolute numbers to so forget. Risk adjustment compared to to, to other markets. And I, th I think what you've seen is a trend by LPs who dip their toes in the water in these markets and are now looking at second or third time funds uh, coming back for fundraisers as well as, as new funds raising capital. Um, perhaps having become a bit more skeptical. And I don't think it's just the macro environment in some of the African markets. I think there is an underlying issue or challenge around returns that GPs have got to that have got to got to address. It's come at a time when private equity returns in, in Europe and certainly in the US and in particular in the mid market have have, have picked up and, and so the comparison has become even less favorable. Um, so, so I suppose what, what what does the future look like? I think to increase appetite for the region, it isn't good enough just to have more political stability um, and to have better GDP growth rates. GDP growth rates in some of the non-commodity markets have been strong in the last few years. I think what has got to happen is fund returns have got to pick up and better investments have got to be made. Well, look, I mean, I think that's a very interesting and, and good controversial point. I mean, we would certainly agree. Um, we, we have found it, we have certainly found that, that startup investments have been an important generator of our return profile and that it is pretty difficult uh, to do perhaps traditional growth or buyout capital within frontier markets and achieve the kind of returns that, that people hope. But perhaps one thing I would I would be quite keen to see actually is what the return of of some of the uh, the the more developed market private equity funds would be without the kind of leverage and liquidity options that that you often don't really have open to you in frontier markets. So, I mean, I think I don't think the, the, the question will be fully answered any time within the next uh, five to ten years, but it, I think it is a, an interesting point for, for all of us to, to perhaps wrap up the webinar on. And uh, I am conscious that we, we have come up to our, to our hour's time limit, and I don't want to get told off by uh, Svetlana and the rest of the super return people, but I do want to take this opportunity to, to obviously thank all of the
of all of the audience, but particularly all of the the participants, um, David, um, uh, Sve uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, all of the participants has been has been very helpful, insightful, and useful. Um, I mean, by way of a quick plug, if you haven't seen it on your screen, just to remind you, if you want to hear more from the participants um, and and join us at the uh, at the Hardship Frontier location that is the Western Cape Town uh, of from the 4th to the 6th of December, uh, you've got a discount code which is, is there up on your screen. There will be a recording of the webinar available to everyone. Uh, and uh, to leave you on a quote, which I like to generally do on these things, I pulled out one from Paul Samuelson, which was, uh, investing should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement, go to Las Vegas. Um, I think uh, I think the alternative could be go to frontier markets in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so with that, uh, thank you everyone, and I I wish you a, a good rest of the day. <laughs>